Welcome to the uh, special fringe meeting today about carries. And uh, we're honored, Martin and I are, that you would take time to join us and talk about your work. And um, I'm just delighted to meet people that I've been talking to for years and to have this conversation. So my personal goal here is for us to make some new friends, to share our work and our passion for conquering this disease that is affecting so many billions of people on planet Earth. Perhaps create some collaborations yeah, going forward. And um, what I don't want this meeting to do is be a format to promote individual ideas, agendas, or products. Although it's perfectly okay to talk about those sort of things. This meeting is not sponsored by anybody. <laughs> so thank you for coming here on your own expense. And we paid for the room, and that's about the, all there is to it. Um, so Martin has been kind enough to uh, be sort of the MC of this meeting. And he's going to tell you about the flow of events throughout the day. And um, so I will, again, say thank you and turn it over to Martin. OK. And we're going to have. 14 presentations, of no more than 10 minutes, for, and each person will say whatever they want about this subject. So we don't know what you're going to say, but we hope it will be, and think it will be stimulating. Then we will have a breakout session. There will be a rest period in, in the middle. So then we'll have a breakout session with people and having small group discussions about whatever area they're interested in that we listed. And then we will have lunch served here so you don't get out. And then we will have a general discussion, which can last up to two hours. We'll have a report from the breakout sessions. Or, sorry. And we'll have a uh, long, long discussion. We hope very fruitful discussion heartfelt, open discussion. And then we will try to summarize what we've learned and what we think might we might do. And then that will be it. The restroom is out that door by the, past the elevators. That's 10 minutes. And it, there's plenty of time for those who are not presenting something to have their say. We want to have as much discussion as possible. That's, that's the, the general outline of what's going to happen. And now I'm going to, this is a Scottish, this is a Scottish Terrier that belongs to our family. I won't tell you any more about him, other than his name is Lord Bentley. But uh, you can ask me later if you want. But he represents Scottish McIntyre. Please listen with open minds and hearts to what each of us has to say and then discuss how to move forward. It should be an embarrassment to the dental profession that caries is rare in some populations and rampant in others. Children of the haves usually don't get caries, even if they avoid the dentist. And children of the have-nots usually don't go to the dentist until they have a toothache. There are an estimated 2.4 billion children and adults who have untreated lesions and many more with untreated disease. The question is, how do we control at the lowest cost for the largest, control carries at the lowest cost for the largest number of people? The present, the present standard of care is surgical excision followed by prosthetic replacement, a very expensive, highly skilled drill and fill protocol. Most people in the world don't have access to this treatment, and it doesn't control, arrest, or cure caries. Fortunately, there are non-surgical alternatives, but unfortunately, they aren't taught in dental schools because their outcomes are considered to be second class. More importantly, there is no monetary incentive to study or use these methods. They are on the fringe of 
dental practice when they should be center stage. That's my cue for a song from the musical South Pacific called You've Got to Be Carefully Taught. You've got to be taught to rue the day. You failed to remove all the decay. You've got to be taught this day by day. You've got to be carefully taught. All dental students are carefully taught, day by day, to fear the leaving the slightest speck of decay. If they do, they will fail the licensing exam. As long as this is true and medical alternatives don't remove the decay, there is an impasse. In 1957, before most of you were born, I was taught that G.B. Black said we should remove all decay. If I had gone to the library, I would have learned that in 1908 he said something quite different about treating children with caries. I quote, and I left a sheet for you to read, but I will try to be Dr. G.B. Black. Leave the decay material in the dentin where it is. Do not disturb it or attempt to remove it. The removal of this is particularly painful to the child. If some decay is left and some dentin is exposed, it should be treated with silver nitrate. The object of this treatment is to fill the part of the dentin softened by decay with the insoluble salt of silver and incidentally to destroy the organisms in it. Generally, decay is effectively stopped by this treatment. And the teeth, although mutilated and out of shape, will be useful to the time of their shedding. We may, if decay is again starting up in some part of the surface we, that had been treated in this way, treat it again, and stop it again, and again if necessary. His words are still true, but unfortunately the lesson was lost with the discovery of Novocaine and fluoride. There is no reason for anyone to suffer from caries. We already know how to achieve what matters most to our patients, no toothaches, no injections, no extractions then why aren't we doing it? Sadly, because there was a strong <clears throat> resistance to change, especially if the change questions the legitimacy of what we were carefully taught and appears to threaten our livelihood. Yet, there is hope for change without convincing dentists or dental organizations. The tipping point for change is a rapidly diminishing pool of aging, full-paid patients who still need the standard surgical protocol. The income gap has been temporarily filled with cosmetic dentistry for the halves who can pay cash. However, this is insufficient in the long run. The new income stream will come from the have-nots, who will be the only ones left with most of the lesions. Medical management of caries is the only option, and it doesn't require removal of But new dentists with large education debts may have a strong economic incentive to seek less expensive non-surgical alternatives that require far less capital and investment and at the same time improves their patient's health at a low fee and a profitable income. Change is inevitable. The silent death knell for the surgical protocol came in 1955 when fluoridated toothpaste was introduced and the look ma, no cavities generation began. In 1965, fluoridated toothpaste were 50% of the market and now they are almost 100% of children's toothpaste. The first wave of users are now in their 50s, like my children. And the prime age for expensive treatments that have always been the main support for high overhead dental offices. Fluoridated toothpaste has allowed many of these early adopters to be caries free, like my children. And every year the number will increase. We are running out of the haves who need and can afford surgical protocol, and we are left with the have nots who need it but can't afford it. To save the day, a heroine appears center stage. Back to my musical. She is the alternative caries protocol who is child friendly, effective, efficient profitable and 
can replace the income from the vanishing high compensation surgical treatments with equal or better income from the low, high volume, low compensation medical treatments. With this scenario in mind, I propose the following objectives for any caries management protocol. Improves dental health. Safe, effective, painless, simple, efficient, low cost, and more profitable than surgical protocol. These objectives can be met with existing technologies that don't require going back to school. It only requires fulfilling the professional obligations to do no harm, treat anyone in need, and improve their health. Also, dentists must swallow hard and leave the decay in the dentin where it is. Once the objectives are agreed, medical management of caries will be proven to be more productive than surgical protocol and will create happier, healthier patients. This is especially true for people living in isolated areas of the world, where until now the only option has been care by, altru by altruistic dentists volunteering their time to relieve suffering on annual trips to extract hopeless teeth. If some of their time were, were devoted to a medical protocol, then each year there would be fewer toothaches and fewer teeth to extract. The cost of the medical alternative is low and would be much lower and more productive if it were applied on site by mid-level providers. In summary, there are worthy objectives, methods, and materials for the medical management of caries that aren't part of standard practice because dentists and dental organizations have resisted adding them. When we accept control of disease as the end point, and when providers are compensated for our health outcomes, then what Dr. Black recommended in 1908 will be recognized as far superior to letting teeth rot so they are painful abscesses, followed by frightening emergency extractions, preventable treatments under general anesthesia, the operating room, and then, of course, one recent notorious event when the child died for lack of care. A 180-degree shift from surgical to medical management can't happen quickly because a large supply of children with untreated caries will become the major pool of patients and source of income. Unfortunately, this shift is more likely to happen because of economic imperatives from the marketplace than by rational discussion. But let's try the latter anyway, knowing we have the prevailing wind at our back. This meeting is already successful simply because it exists and you're here. A meaningful success will require agreement on specific measurable objectives for medical management of caries. Once this is accomplished, then studies can measure success on criterion other than the retention rates. Then and only then will toothaches, injections, fillings, abscesses, extractions, space maintenance, root crowns, root canal treatments, bridges, implants, and false teeth become the subject of a course in dental history. We're, each one of us has this whatever we want to say. Thank you, Martin. Martin's been a big inspiration for me and in all the work he's done throughout his career. Uh, a couple of things I forgot to mention. Mo most of us are going to get to know each other during the discussion groups, which will occupy most of this time. And so I would w hold off on questions until the, the discussion group. Um, and also, um, we're recording this event. Everyone has given consent. This meeting will be available on our website uh, for anyone to look at. Um, so if there's anything you don't want to say to the world, don't say it here. Um, and, and it's also important to use the mic so that the recording is done well. So um, if you're up here speaking, please keep the mic right next to your mouth. And we have another mic which will go around in the discussion groups. And so please continue to use uh, the mic. Two people, uh, most of us are dentists, uh, scientists, and public health. Uh, we have a couple of people that are not in that category that I'd like to introduce. Uh, number one is Dr. Karen Sokol Gutierrez. Karen, would you stand up? Karen is a pediatrician with UC California Berkeley School of Public Health. I met her by uh, watching her frontline story about the extreme rates of dental curies in El Salvador. We've been collaborating for some time now, a remarkably inspiring person. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, 
She didn't come to the IADR meeting, by the way. <laughs> she came to this meeting. Thank you for that. And um, Helene, El I'm, I'm going to let you pronounce your last name. Okay, is a fourth year dental student from UC San Francisco and is on the committee representing the student body evaluating silver nitrate in the use of the medical management of curies at that university. So uh, the word's getting out. I'm very happy to uh, hear that. So congratulations and, and welcome once again. So I'm going to go into my uh, 10 minutes here. And um, the first disclaimer is that I took this beautiful image right off the cover of the ODA magazine <laughs> without their permission for their annual meeting. But it's so wonderful showing the past and the future together and how we're using what we knew, know, and what we're going to know to take us into the future. So um, I am the owner of a general dental practice. I'm the dental director of Oral Health Outreach, which is an advocacy program, an education pro uh, organization. And I'm a founding partner in Nodike, which is a medical device entity, and the editor of Medical Management of Curious Library, where all of our electronic uh, uh, information is located. Um, this is an image of a tooth that was extracted less than two weeks ago by John Frischella, who's going to present via video in Central Oregon on an eight-year-old child. It's a six-year molar on an eight-year-old child that had to be extracted because of extreme tooth decay. This, this is just sad that this is happening in the world today. And what we know is that this medicine applied at the right time could have avoided that. We all know about the Amante driver. Martin alluded to this case, very sad case. And it is just incredible to me that this could have been prevented if the right medical intervention had occurred at the right time. So this is serious business. I'm not here to tell you about my story. Many of you know the story, and I don't want to tear, I'm getting tired of telling it, okay? And if, if you don't know it, all right, you can read this paper in the uh, CDA journal, which is on our electronic library, which talks about the learning curve that happened in my practice, and then this report um, in the Lund report, this paper in the Lund report, Medical Manager Curious Paradigm Shift. It's available, that's available to you if you want to know my story. I want to talk about Equitable. We're doing a project right now that I'm extremely excited about that I want to share with you. Uh, the first story is that the Ecuador Ministry of Health reached out to us, probably by stumbling across the MMC library and learning some information that we were doing something differently. And they said, we want to learn what you're doing. And the reason for that is because 90% of our school children have tooth decay. And 50% of our children have pain. Astonishing. And we, we have to do something differently. So in January, these two dentists from the Ministry of Health in Ecuador flew to Portland, Oregon, and spent three days with us treating patients, going through the MMC library materials, and learning about the medical management of curies. Astonishingly, um, one of the dentists, uh, Dr. Sineda here, had actually used silver nitrate 30 years ago when she got out of dental school. She had heard about it and tried it, but didn't know how to use it, but had an open mind to the medical management of curies. So we then moved forward with the idea of creating a pilot project in Ecuador to validate what they had learned during their visit to us. And a very comprehensive pilot program was designed. The author is Kelly Matthews, a dental hygienist in Oregon, who helped us put this together. The Ministry of Health contributed in this. And so we had a very mature pilot program uh, design. Um, January 15th. The pilot occurred in Ibarra, Ecuador, about an hour and a half north of Quito. Um, this is the population. There were 165 primary school, school children, ages approximately 4 to 14. There were, was a special needs school in Ibarra where they had children with all sorts of diff different physical and mental disabilities that had the terrible access to care. 
And then just recently, a preschool of children under four years of age were included in this pilot. Number one is we obtained consents from parents, schools, and the government to conduct this pilot. This is an image of the school, the Galapagos School, about 45 minutes outside of Ibarra. This is what the correct classroom looked like before we reconverted into a dental mash unit, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, this is an image from the special needs school where children were treated. I want to digress for just a moment and mention that in 2010, the Pan American Health Organization initiated a program in Ecuador called Carries Free Communities. And at that time, the dentists and the Ministry of Health initiated what they felt was the best knowledge about reducing dental decay in Ecuador. And so when this is Dr. Sineda talking back in 2010 to the community, and my point here is that our pilot has been integrated into that existing program. So instead of being a sort of um, medical mission to Ecuador, uh, like many organizations do, this is embedded inside of the Ministry of Health program. Um, what, did we, what did they do there? Every child received a comprehensive oral examination with a dentist. All abscess teeth were extracted. And of the 165 kids, about 10 had frank, obvious abscesses, and they needed to go over to the corner and get the tooth pulled. And that's what happened. All children receive prevention education and toothbrushing, although they get that every day as part of the Caries Free Communities program. All active caries lesions were treated three times with silver nitrate and fluoride varnish over two weeks. So every single cavity was treated three times using that protocol. Uh, and then any adverse events and early outcomes were gathered just days ago on March these are some images of that activity. Um, these, these slides show what I call technology transfer. So uh, Tiffany uh, is a team member in our clinic in Oregon who went to Ecuador and worked with Seneda and the other dentists that came to visit us. And so Tiffany helped ensure that the methodology, the use of the technology, everything that was being done was very carefully transferred to the Ecuadorian dentists. And this image shows now Tiffany assisting Dr. Sineda in her efforts. There were eight other Ministry of Health dentists that participated in this pilot, and all were trained in a similar way. All were using the pilot program documentation uh, as they were trained. Here are some great uh, MASH unit images. You can see that the dental, uh, or the, the school desks were turned into dental chairs and, and uh, tabletops for treatment. Digital images were taken of every arch of every child that was treated. So we have, we'll now have before and after photographic images as well as documentation in a paper format of what happened. What are we measuring? We want to know, and I want to give a special thanks to uh, Dr. Karen, who I've been talking with on and off over the past year about this project, and she's provided a lot of feedback on how to improve this pilot. And so a lot of the data that we're going to be pulling out comes from my interaction with her. And I can't thank you enough. And the, the one that I wouldn't have thought of is how many kids are in pain? Well, in Ecuador, half the kids are in pain every day. So that became one of the metrics, mouth pain. She also suggested that we start looking at general nutrition. So we did height and weight. Right here, we're measuring height and weight on every child at baseline, okay? Then there's a whole series of questions on oral health quality of life that is part of this before we did anything. Then we did a complete dental diagnosis. All active caries are gonna be uh, measured as going from active to inactive. And we're gonna do that at three months, six months, and 12 months on over 1,000 teeth. This is a huge data set. Really a huge data set. And then we're also going to be able to look at academic performance uh, over this period of time. We have a lot of data, okay, uh, collected and a lot coming, and we'll be analyzing it. So I don't have the, all of the answers, okay? 
but I can tell you what's happening right now. This is in Spanish, and I'm going to try and translate it for you as it goes. This is the principal of the Galapagos School outside of Ibarra. She's going to be talking about how she feels about the pilot in her school. This is her daughter who was treated. And uh, I think it's going to be marvelous. Go ahead and run the video. See, Senor. Aquí, aquí, aquí. Aquí estamos con la señora directora de la escuela. The principal and her daughter. Con Nayeli, que le hicimos el tratamiento tres veces. Three treatments. Las caries, y ahora queremos preguntarle a la mamá y a la directora de la escuela cómo le ha ido a la niña con el tratamiento. So she used to help Keith that bothered her every day. Now they don't hurt. Not a really good exam, but... Are you not hurting? Are you not hurting? No. How many people's teeth don't hurt anymore? Raise your hand if your teeth don't hurt. <laughs> so it's just amazing that going back, you know, at one month, we're finding this metric that nobody's complaining of tooth pain. It's great. Okay, so what's coming next? I'd like to give thanks to my father, Ralph, who uh, is a general dentist, inspired me to go into dentistry, and went to the <coughs> University of Washington, where I was born. <laughs> 60 years ago, and who used silver nitrate when he got out of dental school and then forgot about it. Interesting story. And then my son Marcus, who's been an important part of this journey, <laughs> provides the, the, the scientific and the business side of what we're doing. So, what's happening next in our agenda? We are working to take the pilot in Ecuador to multiple countries around the world. These are the countries that we're looking at. Don't forget to mention Jim. Our other family member. Thank you. You know, <laughs> wait, Jim, raise your hand. I have my brother Jim, also a dentist, here with us today. <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't there for the photo op, but also has used silver nitrate. So you can ask him some questions about it. So we're a dental family. We would like to be able to reproduce the outcome that is happening in Ecuador in multiple locations, and this is we're partnering with an NGO to make this happen, and it will happen during this coming year. Um, no needles, no drills, no pain, just smiles. That's, this is, when I saw this happening in my practice, it was a miracle. And I knew that I could never go back. And if I'm going to thank anyone for that insight, it is Peter Milgore, who's here with us today. <laughs> I was in an audience 15 years ago when he said, there's this stuff not available in America called silver fluoride and it stops caries. I'd never heard of it. And and Mike Shirtcliffe, I don't know Mike's here, you know, we're sitting next to each there's Mike. We're sitting next to each other and go, what's that? Everything we're doing doesn't work. And so that began this whole journey to discover. And I've I've read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers. I've dug through old archives. Yesterday we were at the Percy Howe archives looking at what he was doing in 1917, okay? All of this is available on the MMC library. So we have hundreds of papers, and uh, Paige Caulfield is here today with us. And Paige, I thank you for inspiring me to make that library. You said, Steve, put it all in one place. And my son Marcus is the one who did it. This meeting will post at that library. If we can do this for one child, and I know that we can, we've done it for hundreds if not thousands of children in our practice. We can do it for a family. We've eliminated caries in families in our practice. Then we can go to a school, we can go to a city, we can go to a province, we can go to a country, and ultimately, I believe, we can do this for the whole world. There is no reason if we can do it for one person that we can't do it for the whole world. We just have to figure out how to do that, since I'm from Oregon, just do it. So once again, thank you, Martin and I, for uh, your being here. Yeah, so um, Steve has asked me to tell my story. 
my story is that I am a pediatric dentist. I've been involved in public health for, um, for uh, as long as I've had a career in dentistry. As soon as I got out of dental school, uh, I became the director of a free clinic for underprivileged children uh, for the city of Bangor, Maine. I was the city dentist uh, for 32 years and I treated teeth uh, in children in a conventional way uh, and uh, uh, doing stainless steel crowns and composite restorations mostly and um, we had fluoride mouth rinse programs and we had uh, puppet shows and millions of yards of floss and uh, we tried to uh, try to arrest tooth decay that way. We tried to stop tooth decay from growing in our community. It was uh, when I first entered in this community, um, I met people who were in their 20s who told me that their graduation present from high school was a set of dentures. And that was the community standard. Uh, I think that was the standard graduation present within that community when I moved into it in 1974. Um, so uh, then I retired after 32 years of treating teeth in conventional ways and I came to realize that uh, I really hadn't even put a dent in, in the amount of tooth decay in that community even though I had fluoridated the community. I was responsible for fluoridating that community and many other communities in Maine. And uh, starting uh, toothbrush programs and fluoride mouth rinse programs and you name it, we had it. Uh, we were in 14 different uh, elementary and high schools and daycare centers uh, for 32 years. Um, and again, I don't really think I put much of a dent uh, in, 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 the, in the carries rate in that community. So then I thought I'd retire and come to Oregon, but uh, when I came to Oregon, I found myself being approached by people saying, hey, you know how to run public health clinics. So long story short, short I ended up opening three federally qualified health center dental clinics in frontier Oregon, not rural Oregon. It was so uh, uh, far out uh, where I was in Oregon that it's called the frontier, federally qualified as a frontier area. There's less than one half of a person per square mile in Wheeler County, Oregon, where I set up three federally qualified health centers. Um, I saw so much decay there that I didn't quite know what to do. Uh, how was I going to eliminate uh, the, the problem uh, by conventional means? Well, it wasn't going to be possible. So uh, we centered our, our uh, federally qualified health centers in the schoolyards. So they're school-based health centers. And uh, I appealed to the community members and to the parents in the community uh, to allow me to go into the schools and grab their children from the classrooms and treat their decay. It was at that time that a colleague uh, with whom I was working uh, also a pediatric dentist like myself, introduced me to silver diamine fluoride. So I started using silver diamine fluoride to see if indeed I could arrest decay, and I found that I could. And I was applying silver diamine fluoride, 38% silver diamine fluoride, and fluoride varnish on teeth, and watching the brown decay turn black and stop. And I said, wow, I'm stopping decay. This is quite remarkable. But I've got to be able to do more than that because I had frank cavitation. I had cavities that although the decay was arrested at the, uh, on the cavity walls and at the floor of that lesion, there was still cavitation into which food was going. So uh, I, I, I wanted to stop the food from getting compressed into that cavitation. So I, I said, well, huh. I wonder if I could apply something on top of this. And it came to my uh, 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 awareness that perhaps glass ionomer would work because I knew glass ionomer released fluoride and maybe a release of fluoride would work synergistically with the silver diamine fluoride. Well, it was about that time that I met Steve Duffin and Steve introduced me to silver nitrate. Well, he kind of reintroduced me to silver nitrate because my dad had treated teeth in, in, in my mouth with silver nitrate back in the 50s. 
He treated uh, uh, some teeth that uh, where the decay was arrested. In fact, I had these little black spots in between my teeth where my father did that when I was probably eight or nine years old, and those teeth have never had to be restored. And he was using the very same brown bottle that Steve gave me the first time I met him. Steve gave me this bottle. I looked at it and I said, oh my gosh, that's the same bottle my father had on the shelf in his dental office in 1950. So I said, well, all right, I'll try it. So <clears throat> I started using 50% uh, and I'll emphasize that again, 50%, not 25% silver nitrate, and uh, found it to be just as effective as 38% uh, silver diamine fluoride, and it was more readily available. I didn't have to get it from Japan. There were people who were criticizing me because I was getting the silver diamine fluoride from Japan, telling me that that was illegal. Uh, I appealed to the FDA to go ahead and put me in jail. They chose not to arrest me, therefore it wasn't illegal. So that was all a bunch of smoke and mirrors. Didn't matter. I had something that was less expensive and more readily available, 50% silver nitrate directly available from Gordon Labs in Upper Darby, PA. So I started getting that and using it and putting glass ionomer on top of it. Now remember, glass ionomer is hydrophilic. Composite is hydrophobic. Placing glass ionomers has to be done in the presence of water or the glass ionomer will not polymerize. It's a very important point. So here I am drying saliva, isolating the tooth, drying the saliva out of the decay. So think of the decay in dentin as being a sponge. That sponge is saturated with saliva. Now we're going to isolate the tooth and with air we're going to dry the saliva. We're going to dry the sponge. Let's resaturate the sponge. Fully saturated. Let it soak, soak it in. What is soaking in? 50% of what is soaking in is silver ions. The other 50% is H2O, which is needed for the polymerization of the glass ionomer. So I use a glass ionomer that I am very specific about this. I have used resin modified glass ionomers. I have used all kinds of different products, different kinds of glass ionomers. The product that I found that would bond without excavation of decay to the saturated, decayed dentin was Fuji 2. Light cure. Why light cure? Because I'm a pediatric dentist. I don't have time. I trade children their good behavior for my speed. I don't have time to screw around. So I use something that works fast and that bonds. What works fast and bonds is Fuji 2. Have I tried other glass ionomers? You bet. Have I tried my resume? I've tried them all. If you out there would like to try something else, have at it, but I bet you anything I've already used it, and I bet you anything it doesn't work. This is what works. So I put it in, and I smush it, and after I smushed it with a gloved thumb or finger or whatever, I smush it, I wet it first, so it smushes down, doesn't adhere to the glove. I smush it, it's that simple. Wonderful instrument, it's always with me. Don't have to go to a kit for it, it's right on my hand. I smush it, then I take any bonding agent. I happen to use Excite because that's what I use for my composite restorations. And I take a fuzzy tip applicator and I put that on there and then I light cure it. Now remember, Fuji 2 is both light cure and sets on its own. So it's dual cure, okay? Fuji tells us we need a coating over Fuji 2 for 24 to 48 hours because that's how long the self-curing polymerization takes, even if you like cure it. It still takes 24 to 48 hours to fully polymerize. We need to protect it from the saliva for 24 to 48 hours. The best way to protect it is with a bonding agent. Can we use other things? Sure. Fuji has a product called Fujiko. I don't use Fujiko. You know why? 
because it's sticky. I don't want anything sticky. I want everything to be smooth and, and like, like oily. I want it to be slick. So when I put it on there, it's slick. It doesn't stick to anything. Why don't I want it to be sticky? Because I don't want to pull it out. I'm not using phosphoric acid. I'm not bonding. I'm using what natural bonding that glass ionomer has for it to stick. Polymerize it with the light, coat the whole thing with fluoride varnish. Why coat it with fluoride varnish? You just sealed silver nitrate inside a, 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 a tooth with glass ionomer that is releasing through its dissolution. Remember, glass ionomers don't wear, they dissolve. They dissolve in saliva over time. As it dissolves, it releases the fluoride. So the fluoride is working with the silver nitrate to arrest the decay. Why do I need fluoride varnish to cover over it? Because silver nitrate tastes terrible. If you put it in your mouth, I'm sure you will gag. So I don't want the child to taste any additional silver nitrate that might be in and around the tooth or on the gum tissue or whatever, and I'm done. Kid walks out, he says, yeah, tastes kind of like bubble gum. Thanks, Dr. John, out the door. So the, why do I do this? I do this because I make the assumption that 99% of the kids I see in public health, I'm never going to see again. It's no different me working in frontier Oregon than me being dropped into sub-Saharan Africa from a helicopter. I'm gonna treat those children once and then I'm going to leave because I don't live in sub-Saharan Africa and I'm never going to see them again. So I have to do as much as I can in one appointment. What is that appointment? The exam appointment? Yes. You mean you're going to do definitive treatment and treat every single tooth in the mouth at the exam appointment? But you need to take x-rays and you need to apply fluoride and you need to do a treatment plan. Yeah, I'll do all those things. That's real fast. And I'm going to treat every single tooth in their mouth. Now, how about the kid that you know is going to come back or the kid that's well behaved enough to get a shot and all of that stuff? Well, that's all fine and good. Are we talking about a patient that's got one caries? I don't treat patients like that. Do you? Well, maybe you do. Then that's your world. My world is seeing patients who have caries in every single quadrant. So should I do what I learned in dental school, treat one quadrant at a time. Well, if I treat one quadrant and then I have to say, well, Mrs. Smith, I'm not able to treat the second quadrant for four weeks or maybe six weeks because that's how far we are out. And she goes, well, Dr. John, we can't come in in six weeks. Our family's going on vacation. Oh gosh, then it's going to be 12 weeks before I get to quadrant number two. How about quadrant number three and quadrant number four? Those teeth are continuing to decay and we're going to lose those teeth. So what do I do? I treat all the teeth at once. I treat them at once and put the dang fire out. Because I don't really believe in the standard of care that we have of treating one tooth or even one quadrant at a time. You know, let me throw this out at you hypothetically. I don't know if you've ever been involved with Mission of Mercy, but let's do a Mission of Mercy together, okay? And we'll go to your whatever state you're from, your state now society, and you got this Mission of Mercy thing going, and you got all these chairs lined up, and all these people are going to, homeless people, and people that really need our care. And we got all these dentists that want to, want to really do some good, and they're going to treat one tooth at a time. So how about if I come in and bust the party? How about if I set up a chair over here and I'm going to put up a sign and it's going to say, would you like to have one tooth at a time treated or would you like to have all the teeth that need to be treated in your mouth treated now in one appointment painlessly without needles and without drills? Well, those people are going to wait in line and be treated by you over there in conventional means and then they're going to look over here and they're going to be running out of time and they're going to say, hey, I'll try this. Which is the best way for us to treat people in need? One tooth at a time? One quadrant at a time? One injection? One drill at a time? Or treat them all at once and put the fire out? And then later, if there's time, if the behavior of the child allows, if they have enough money, we can go back to conventional means. So I'm not taking anything out of my toolkit. I will show you some of the very best stainless steel crowns you've ever seen because I've done 40 years of the dang things. I can do them impeccably and I can do composites impeccably. 
I'm adding something to the toolkit. I'm adding silver nitrate, which was there in the first place, but taken out when? In 1950. Why? Because we thought if we fluoridated communities, we would eradicate tooth decay from one end of this country to the other. And you know what? We didn't. It didn't work. Not that fluoridating communities is a bad thing. Maybe it's a good thing. But I know that it doesn't take care of the caries crisis that is inherently there then and even more so now. So we need something more. And that extra thing is something that was there originally that we once took out, open the toolkit, put it back in, end of story.